Hello, and welcome to another edition of The One Team We Agree On. I'm Jillian. And I'm Kyle. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. How about yourself? I'm doing great, thanks. And, uh, you know, we're picking up a conversation from the United Soccer Coaches Convention. Um, Our guest today is the uh, former head coach at University of South Dakota, uh, currently nationally uh, national recruiting coordinator with Tudor Collegiate Strategies, and is the president of Busy Coach. Um, glad to get you on here. Um, our guest today is uh, Mandy Green. Mandy, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks, you guys, for having me on. Uh, no problem. Thank you so much. I'm glad we finally got to connect. Uh, I know, right? I still feel bad. I'm sorry. I, I tried to get over there, but. Well, you know how conventions are. I mean, you're mm-hmm. running into people and then you got a meeting, you're going to this and then you got a present, present it. it no, nah, I've been there. That's like the whole time I'm like, yeah. you know, at least we'll eventually be able to connect. And so I'm glad <laughs> we are. Yeah. So, uh, and also, uh, Special shout out to our friend Todd Lewis, uh, who is helping us out tonight with the production and is live as well. Todd, how are you doing? I'm doing good, guys. Uh, thanks for inviting me back on here and uh, glad we all made it back safely from Anaheim and uh, we're able to continue on these conversations with uh, people we had scheduled uh, for the convention. And um, yeah, I mean, it's been a blast just talking with all these different people involved in the game. And uh, this is going to be another great com- uh, conversation. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, Mandy, uh, if you could tell our listeners uh, just briefly how you got into soccer, then we kind of talked about it uh, before we started recording, transitioning into coaching, and then your your time in South Dakota. Just kind of give us a little rundown of that. Yeah, no, I mean, I started, you know, it's, I think my mom was just trying to get me out of the house and I grew up actually owning, my parents owned a bakery. And so I think they were just trying to like, get me to burn some energy because I I literally would sit around and eat donuts and cookies all day. Right. Cause it was just surrounded uh, by us all the time. Um, But yeah, no, I mean, I grew up playing four sports and just, I don't know, just kind of liked it. And I, I was that kid that was always outside and, I wasn't playing video games or doing like sitting around watching TV. I was the kid that was banging a ball against the garage, right? And out the backyard with the cones out and doing my own drills. I started reading books about soccer, even when I was middle school, high school. I don't know what it was. It just kind of was something I was really into. And then, um, I mean, then when I, I, I went, I spent my first two years at Loyola of Chicago, and then I transferred home and played my last two years at McAllister College. And when I was about to graduate, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I I, I, I kind of sort of set up a mass. I was going to get a, my master's degree uh, from a school in Minnesota and then was going to coach. I got a grad assistant position at a different school, and I... I don't know. It, and I was kind of engaged to be engaged and I, and I thought I had everything set. And then I, my high school coach got me into coaching. He's like, you know what? This U13 girls team needs, uh, needs a coach. Actually it was U17. U17 was my first coaching job. They're like, they need somebody, please. The guy fell through and we try it. And I was the person I'm like, I don't like being in front of people. I don't want to talk like, eh, you know, I just was uncomfortable with it. But I don't know. I just did it that summer. I brought my little brother with and we just laughed. We laughed all summer and it was the best thing. And then that spring I was at a tournament with the team and um, it was in Arizona and I just happened to see, so when I was at Loyola of Chicago, the it was a husband and wife team, and they ended up leaving after the fall of my freshman year and went to Utah, University of Utah. And I just, I happened to see him. I hadn't seen him for years and tapped him on the shoulder and he remembered who I was and he called up Amy, the the head coach and like, re, you know, re, you know, just, just got connected us again. And I don't know, we, she, she actually invited me to come out and be the volunteer assistant. I'm like, I'm not moving to Utah from Minnesota is where I was. I'm not moving to Utah to take a volunteer position. And she goes, how about this? Come and work the camp and just meet the team and meet the people and see everything and just hang out for a little bit. 
Well, within a week of coming back uh, from that camp, I had called the school I was supposed to go to, told them I wasn't coming. I called the school I was supposed to coach at, told them I wasn't coming. I actually broke up with a guy I was dating and moved out to Utah a month later. And then that's where I, I got my first coaching job. I was in a volunteer assistant at University of Utah. I took on personal training jobs. I coached ODP. I coached multiple club teams. I was donating plasma by that winter because I really needed the 20 bucks, right? But I loved it. And I I mean, I just, the people I was around, it was the most fun thing ever. Still to this day, I want to say it was the most fun I had coaching with that group of people I was with. We just laughed. We laughed all the time. So it was great. But that's how I got, I mean, it was, hopefully that's a short answer to your short question, or that was kind of a long answer to short question, but it was, that's how I kind of got into it. I never thought I was ever going to get into college coaching. It just, who I knew uh, and just being in the right place at the right time and taking an advantage of an opportunity that presented itself, you know, it wasn't ideal and it was hard. And I moved away from my family and I moved away from the person I was dating and started brand new. I literally had a thousand dollars in my pocket. I figured it out. And it, I mean, 23 years later, you know, I still, I still get offered to, Hey, do you want to interview for this position? No, no, I'm good. I'm good at this point. So, I mean, I started at Utah and then I wanted to get back to Minnesota so I spent five years at Minnesota State, Mankato, and then we wanted to get back into Division One soccer. And so uh, we moved out to Loyola Marymount in L.A. and lived in L.A. for a year. And then we went to Xavier for a year. And then I got the job at University of South Dakota and I was there for eight years. And then we uh, then we moved to Youngstown, Youngstown, Ohio, and have been here gosh, six years now. So. But it's amazing, like people that I met at conferences and people that I met through coaching courses, those are still some of my best friends ever. I met my husband through one of the coaching licenses. So, I mean, all of, all of the stuff, right? I mean, every, it's such a small world with soccer and the people that you meet and get to know, you know, it's, uh, I am trying to teach my daughter, my 10 year old daughter to kind of get into some club stuff. And I'm like, I promise you, you don't see it now, but these people that you're meeting will be your friends forever because this is just what why you should get involved in sports right so so yeah i mean that's kind of a hopefully the the short answer to my kind of journey into you know just starting as a club and loving it and eventually getting into college coaching because of it and what were some of the lessons you took from your time at university of south dakota like because you started that team from scratch or like it was like maybe not scratch but you like kind of rebuild it right I did. It was, well, it, uh, so I became a first time head coach and a first time mom all within mm -hmm. 10 days of each other. Uh, and I, it was, I mean, it was in a, it was in a position where it was transitioning from division two to division one. And mm -hmm. I had been that senior group that year. I had been their third head coach, I think, I think in the four years that they had been there. And so, you know, it just the, the person that was there the two years before me just didn't, didn't do much to cultivate a positive and productive environment uh, and didn't really recruit, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the players that we had were, were decent, uh, but it was just the, just the, I don't know, just, there was a lot of things that um, I felt bad for those players because they got thrown into a hot mess of a situation, but we, yeah, I mean, we, we had to, go out. So when I got the job in April, I mean, literally, I just had my son. I, uh, I was telling you, I coached in a game the night before. Um, and then I actually was in the hospital Monday to Thursday. I flew out that next Tuesday after having oh, had wow. a C-section, right? I had to buy the maternity suit and I bought the belt to like suck my gut in. It was great. It was, it was, it was so crazy. And that like literally on my interview, right before I left, the couple guys that took me to lunch, they're like, so do you have any kids, you know, just creating small talk. And I'm like, uh-huh, I do. And they're like, oh, how old? I'm like about a week. And they're like, that's because I told them I couldn't come, you know, because I had just had surgery and <laughs> they're like, yeah, we can delay it a week. And I mean, yeah, um, I got a lot of stories, right? I mean, I've had a crazy journey and I've been all of us, right? You're in this profession mm -hmm. long enough, like yeah. weird things happen and funny things happen. But I mean, there's a lot that I learned. I mean, it was hard. It was really hard having, I was not blessed with children that slept well. 
And so trying to fix, you know, I mean, the schedule was wrong. The field was bad. The, you know, there were so many things changing the perception of what it was and where we were going and trying to display like, you know, I believe in me and I believe in where I'm taking this program, even though there were so many, I mean, in the school, right? I mean, rightly so was really focused on football and on basketball. And so it was putting a lot of time in that. And so it was basically, they didn't say it, but it was basically don't, you know, do what you need to and just kind of do your thing. And we're here if you ever need anything, but we got to focus on them. So, you know, do your thing. And I mean, it was, there was a lot of hard things to deal with and there were a lot of things to overcome. And so uh, I always joke that, you know, have you seen the the pictures of the presidents before and after they were, Mm -hmm. you know, oh my God, I was a hot mess. It was, there were so many things that I had to deal with, but I mean, it was, it was a a lot to learn. Uh, And I think just through recruiting and some of the, the things I dealt with, I mean, honestly, it became painfully clear to me who is the type of, just in recruiting my future teams, who is the type of kid I wanted to avoid. And so I really learned how to listen and I will ask better questions and then listen because the better I listened or the better I, I worded things, I got and then listened because I don't. I think you can't learn anything new about somebody if you're doing all the talking, right? So I, uh, I asked and I listened and I figured out, right, how to talk to people in a way that gets them to do what you want to do. And so, and that's where, you know, it kind of transitioned me into working with Dan Tudor when, like my husband, my husband is a longtime soccer coach and we got to a point where it's just too hard for the both of us to coach together. And so, I don't know, it just, when we were transitioning out of South Dakota, it was, you know, I mean, South Dakota, right. You got to learn to lead people and you got to learn how to manage conflict and you got to learn how to organize yourself. You know, you got to take care of yourself first, because if you're not taking care of yourself, how are you ever going to take care of the people that you're leading? And so, I mean, there's so many lessons I learned that it was, there was a lot of hard things, but it was a lot of, okay, I need to stop doing this. I need to start doing that. I need to do less of this, more of that. And I got to continue, you know, so it was just a constant retooling of, you know, just trying to keep me focused and going in the right direction. So there were a lot, a lot of things, but like my husband and I, we always joke, like, I think if you can coach together, you can survive anything. And so we're, you know, we're still going strong. Our kids are now 10 and 13. And so (laughs) we're still alive. So it's all good. Right. Yeah. We can certainly relate because Kyle and I have been coaching together, swimming, you know, for a while. That's actually how we met, um, you know, coaching. I hired her. Yeah. I hired hired her. And then, you know, two years later, we're married. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good because you get to see each other a lot, but it's bad because you get yeah. to see each other a lot, right? <laughs> right. 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 Um, but yeah, definitely. And it's no, it's so interesting hearing, you know, your journey through that. And, and it really is like, you know, when, you know, with swimming for us, it's like, it's a small world and like all the connections you make. Right. And so we certainly like, um, definitely understand, um, how that goes. But that's, that's so interesting. I'm um, hearing how, you know, you got to see all those different places and, and take a bit from each of those. And, um, and Utah is beautiful. It so is. Like that, man, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so let me talk about how you got involved with Dan Tudor and how college recruiting has changed since 2020. Thank you. I, um, so when I was coaching at Minnesota state Mankato, I was, I mean, we were good. We were like a top five team in the country my response rate to my first message was horrible. I would, and I, I spent a lot of time on that thing. And so I loved that message, right? Cause I had put so much time and effort into it. Well, it wasn't getting me a great response. And so it was causing me to spend more money and go out and just to get more kids, you know, get more names, but still I wasn't getting a great response. So I felt like I was spinning my wheels. Well, it was about that time, Dan, started his company. I think he was only two or three years in. It was just 2007. And I went, it was, it wasn't a hard sell to go from Minnesota in December to California in the winter. Uh, but I went out for a workshop of his and li- I, so I show this, I do a lot of workshops throughout the country and I show this, I literally still had the, the, the messages that I was sending and I had the exact copies of 
after hearing Dan tell me all the things that I shouldn't talk about in my first message, I literally had the recruit's name in my signature. Everything else, he's like, they don't need to hear about it right now. Just cross it off the list. So, and then through his guidance of things to do and not do in the first message, I mean, I was at the same school, same location, same record, same academic, same everything, different words on a page. And my response rate went from 10 to 80% with recruits. And I was sold. I was sold after that. And Dan and I just kept in touch. I don't know why. Like we just kind of connected and kept in touch. And, you know, every now, every few months or every year or something, hey, Mandy, how's it going? Like just checking in, you know. And he kept saying, like, he'd been trying to get me out of college coaching for like 15 years because he's like, Mandy, you kind of got a knack for some of these things and how you talk to like, that's like you should, or just how it organized. Um, because I, if ha- I was working 24 seven and I was burning myself out, I need, I can't, got to a point where I'm like, I need to change. I either need to get organized and find a better way to go about working because this whole hustle and grind wasn't working for me as a mom uh, who was trying to stay sane and healthy enough, right, for my son. But it was, uh, I don't know, I just, I had been doing that kind of stuff. And so he then invited me to go speak at his recruiting conference over the summer. And then he kept saying, Mandy, when you're done with coaching, like you're coming to do this with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I still got a few years left. The next year, Mandy, you know, speak at my conference again, you know, are you ready? Are you, you know, or when you're ready, I want it to be the first phone call. And then I don't know, just at the end of South Dakota, I was tired and I was exhausted and I was frustrated and I just needed kind of a timeout and a, a change of scenery. So I'm like, well, Dan, if you're ready, you know, I'm, I'm ready to give this a shot. And I don't know. I mean, so I've been working with Dan for about six years. I'm actually his vice president now. And I manage mm, hundreds of clients and I do workshops all over the place. And um, it is a really cool part of my job. I mean, I think that's why I got into coaching. I love the coaching and the teaching and the interactions and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. And so it is hard working out of my house and just talking to people through the computer a good chunk of the day. But still, some of the things I get to work on them with and then to see in, I get to see live how it's working. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I talked to a tennis coach today. I'm like, all right, what's the situation? Told me about this recruit. Okay, try this. Now go do that and ask this. And when she says this, do that and let me know how it goes. And I got a text message. She committed like, you know, so I mean, things like this, it's just getting coaches their confidence back and eliminating mistakes Mm -hmm. and improving their learning curve. And a lot of it is just adjusting how they say things. It's so simple and it doesn't take a massive hit to the budget besides the cost of working with us. Right. But it's, um, I don't know, it's a cool job. And Dan Tudor, I don't know if, you know, you said you've met him when, when you're at Millersville, right. Is, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if you, you really got the full Dan Tudor personality, but he's funny and he, he is, is he's sarcastic and he is, uh, I mean, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. No, he he is. And, you know, I remember, like, I think it was right when he was two years into his company. It was like yeah. one of my first years as a coach and just right into it. So, I mean, it's interesting. You're right. The interesting of, hey, you're trying to sell this and they don't want to hear it. And I think that was the biggest takeaway I saw was they didn't want to hear about it. Because you brought something up earlier when you were talking about your time in South Dakota was we spend a coaches spend a lot of time whether it's the club level or college they'll try and sell their program to potential Mm -hmm. you know families and athletes and i'm finding more and more now that it's more about like you said just answer asking the questions and you're spending more time listening than talking determining whether or not this athlete is a better fit for you i would say the coaches that are doing the best in recruiting comes to them pretty easily they're not doing all the talking. And I mean, we do, I mean, we do find, and I, I certainly a hundred percent was guilty of this is, you know, we vomit all the information because it's exciting and it's new and we want to share all the things. Um, and we share everything, the first few conversations, and it leaves us very little to talk about after that. Cause it feels like we shared everything, you know? And so coaches become the check-in coaches. And, you know, I mean, you had asked what's different. Well, these kids, I mean, coaches, you're not, just recruiting against 
your competitors for these recruits. You're also compute, uh, competing with their attention with Instagram and TikTok and all the things that are being thrown at these kids. And so if you can't get their attention and keep their attention, and I mean, how amazing would that be? You know, it, it, like, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned we're salesmen with coaches, 100%, but we don't get one phone call closes like a lot of salesmen do, right? I mean, this is over the course of many, many months, if not, you, mm -hmm. you know, a year or two, even some, some coaches are recruiting kids. And so how do you extend the conversation? But I mean, also the, the impact that social media is having. I mean, I was in this, I always tell the story. I was in a, a locker room with this basketball team in Texas. And I asked the team, did, did social media impact or influence how, where you chose to go to school? And this one girl goes, I eliminated a school because I saw them country line dancing in the locker room before practice. And I hate country music. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? But that mattered to her. And so mm -hmm. that's what I, I love. And my biggest job I would say with working with Dan is, you know, coaches as adults, we think we know and understand what a kid needs to do and think and hear and, you know, act on to make a decision. But the reality is, is how these kids are making decisions are different these days. And so my job is to close the gap, right. And make it less confusing from the coach's perspective and what can they control. And a lot of it is just how they say things and their consistency that can make all the difference in the world with kids. But yeah, it's a lot of listening, asking great questions and listening. Cause if we can't, usually it's the coach who figures out what they value and what they'll spend money on, right? And then dialing in their message to that stuff, you know, is how how the great coaches are very successful with recruiting. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of coaches right now, you know, coaching and time management are <laughs> frenemies. Let's put it that way. You know, time management can be a problem for a lot of coaches. There's a million things to do a day. Just from where you are talking and dealing with coaches on a daily basis, what are the three biggest areas where you see the most need for improvement with your typical coach, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the biggest areas of improvement needs to be prioritization, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you've heard the 80-20 they're really, you know, to, because most coaches, I mean, there are some coaches are certainly in programs where they can just kind of maintain and they're good, you know, but a lot of coaches, what do we get into this profession for? We're competitive and we want to win and we want the best and all the things. And, but what coaches don't realize is that they're spending a good majority of their day, not working on the right things to actually, that will actually get them there. And so that's where, what a big thing that I'm helping coaches with is let's key in on what are the vital tasks? Cause there are thousands of things you could do, but there's only a few that will move the needle. And then it's, you know, I, I'm all about, I mean, I, I call it magic time. There is a time of the day when your energy is good, your focus is good and you get the fewest distractions Mm -hmm. And if we can align that and protect that, like you would practice, right? Nothing usually changes practice time, not a phone call, not a meeting that came. Nope. It's practice. So we work our way around it. Mm -hmm. So what are these vital things that you need to do to build? Well, align greatest energy and focus when you get the in fewest interruptions with those vital tasks, you work on that in 30, 60, 90 minute chunks you can make more progress in a day than most people make in a month, right? It's just choosing to work on the right things at the right time. A lot of it is what do we eliminate, you know, and eliminate distractions, eliminate, you know, interruptions, eliminate scrolling or, you know, the bright shiny object of the computer elimination. You know, most coaches have no idea where their time is going. They don't realize how much time they're losing to distraction. I think it's so much easier to get ahead today because everybody's so distracted <laughs> by all the stuff, you know? And so, I mean, there, there's a lot, a lot of things, but once you're clear on what you need to do, and then you you're intentional about showing up and doing certain things at certain times, I think if you can get at least even that one one big thing done, the rest of the day will work itself out. I don't think coaches mm -hmm. can have super structured days because you've got athletes coming in and out, right? Mm -hmm. But we got to protect something because you have a job 
and a program to build, right? And it's not going to happen if you, I've never seen a powerhouse program built on randomness, right? You got to be intentional mm-hmm. and then not all day, every day, just certain key chunks of the day, you know, can, can really help, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head too, because people are so distracted nowadays that you can actually be very productive, you know, just by staying focused on, you know, and prioritizing. And Mm -hmm. I've learned that Mm -hmm. both good and bad, you know, sometimes I've had to learn through some failures. Mm -hmm. Oh no, for sure. Right. (laughs) I think we've all been a hot mess at some point. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about busy coach. Uh, what caused you to create it and how has that evolved over time? I never thought I was going to create a company. That wasn't my intention. I, it evolved because I was figuring out things I needed to do as a coach to solve my own problems, right? Because I wasn't planning every day was random. So I came up, I started studying what people were doing in the business world. Cause you know, like you mentioned Mm -hmm. earlier, Kyle, like there's nothing for coaches. I had no training when I got mm-hmm. out of college. You know, it was me learning and reading on my own and doing things and buying courses and listening to podcasts. It was, mm-hmm. I got to figure this stuff out. Right. And then I don't know. And that's, I think it was Dan Tudor knew some of the things that I was doing to take care of myself, get more sleep, stay healthy, uh, eat better sleep, you know, all that stuff. And then it was, how can I show up today with a million things going on? Cause I didn't have full-time help my first three years there. I didn't building a division one program. I didn't have full-time help. My son had been to 23 States by the time he was two, because he, we just had to bring him everywhere with this. Right. But mm-hmm. it was just, it was a lot of running around with my hair on fire for the first few years. And then it was like, wait, I got to figure this out because I just can't keep doing the things the way that I'm doing them. And so, I don't know. It was just like I tried one thing and I'm like, oh, okay, that worked. That like that. Okay, let me let me try this. And now let me do that. And oh, okay, I can I can I can optimize and I can create, you know, maybe even a little checklist. You know, I think a big thing that I I talk to a lot of coaches about is, you know, the difference between customization and automation, you know, especially when in terms of recruiting. Or even, uh, you know, like scheduling an on-campus visit, okay? Yes, we want to make the recruit feel like we're creating an itinerary based on what they want to do, but there's so many repeat tasks. Are we customizing an individual, like everything in our head? Or can we just create simple standard operating procedures, have it on a, you know, a Google Doc, so no matter what assistant or what, what coach on staff is there, they can just crank it out, right? That's a way to automate it. So it's just so just different things to simplify. I mean, I had to start with me and what do I need to do to get me on track and stay on track consistently, not just one or two days at a time, but over the long term, if I want to stay in this profession for any length of time. Mm-hmm. But then it was, okay, I got people. <laughs> I got people mm-hmm. around me and there's a lot of things going on. So how do I create better systems for how we can work together to make all this easier because ultimately right we want to get into we all get into coaching because we want to coach mm-hmm. we don't want to spend all our time doing office stuff right but most people are doing office stuff because they don't have systems and everything's random and everything is they open up their inbox and let their inbox be their to-do list and so i just tried to i just figured out through watching other people and learning from my own mistakes things that worked in the profession and again it started with one presentation dan tutor Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and him encouraging me to, you know, you should write a book. I've never written a book. I don't got time to write a book, but it mm-hmm. just, it took me two years, two years to to put kind of a time management guide for coaches together. Mm-hmm. And then that led to a recruiting book that it's, these are the recruiting systems that I use. And then, I don't know, it just kind of, it started as books. And then, then it's like, well, you know, I kind of got some things that I could teach and then it became a little course. And then it, you know, now I have a recruiting made simple membership where coaches come and they show up every single month once. And we talk through different aspects. So we're talking this next month about micro commitments. It's a big thing I talk about with, with Dan Tudor people is if we can get the recruit to say yes to us a lot consistently throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coach, I love your coaching style. Not so much that one. Yeah. Coach. I love how your team interacts. 
you know, that, and it's different. Other teams are like that. Which do you want? Yeah, coach. I like this. Not that, you know, a lot. Yeah, coach. I can follow you on Instagram. Yeah, coach. I can send you my schedule, you know, because those are objective things. And because, right, they either do it or they don't do it. And mm -hmm. if coaches pay attention to those actions, and that's where I'm trying to help them track, but track the actions and you can see quicker, you know, the patterns of who's moving faster with us. Probably increased probability with every yes, you're going to get a commitment versus, you know, where are kids falling off so we can adjust. So you see where I'm going with it. Like it's a, it's yep. a lot, it's all kind of interconnected with the the busy coach and Dan Tudor, but it started by me just being an emotionally and physically exhausted mom who was trying to keep up with everything and keep the team all there and healthy and doing the things they needed to do. And I mean, we had some success and even our last year there, man, we were so close. Like had we had a goal scorer, <laughs> but too many balls off the posts and this and that and all the things. It just it wasn't bad. Like even my administrator goes, Mandy, if you didn't have bad luck, you would have no luck. Like <laughs> it just, it was meant to be, we needed to kind of get out there and just change of scenery and change of things. But busy coach became more of a, a full-time thing for me. And I have a chance to work with Dan Tudor now and, you know, get to do all this stuff with coaches now. It's amazing so, how life works like that for sure. Um, and it's a blessing in disguise sometimes, as you know, as a coach too, but let's um, kind of talk to me about like the core principles of busy coach, obviously recruiting is one time management, but like, what is there? Because when I read over, like, you know, the synopsis of different courses, kind of give us a little, I guess, sales pitch, you know, kind of tell us a little bit for the listeners out there that might be coaches that are interested. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, like I kind of already said a little bit is yeah. first it's self management. You know, if we can't manage ourselves, we can't manage other people. And so how do we, you know, we got to get our energy right. We got to get our mindset right. We got to make sure you know, we're doing, uh, showing up with intention to do the right things at the right time. Um, and then a lot of it is rest and recharging our batteries, you know, so it's some of those simple self-discipline, you know, how do we control our environment uh, to make sure, you know, we're, we're, we're not putting ourselves in a bad position with some of that stuff, but so self-management, self-leadership, and then a lot of it is, you know, if you're working with people, you know, if you have to lead people uh, or, you know, you've got, you know, with coaching, right. We know that there's a lot of repeat tasks that you do every year. How can we get it out of your head onto in like, I always start with a, a master to do list. So at the soccer convention, I think in both presentations I did, I talked about a master to do list is like my central planning system. There's so many things that coaches do every single year that, happen every single year and they have multiple steps to it well out of your head on the paper so it's easy to plan get ahead and be proactive with some of these things so self and then team team leadership and this isn't like your current team this is staff right that we're we're talking about but i would say those those are the the two big areas that i that focus on a lot and then there's a lot of little strategies that apply with all of it right Absolutely. Um, so I guess my final question, where do you still see, I guess, where would you still see areas that coaches like a coach that goes through your program? It, it's probably specific because some coaches have blind spots and others don't, but mm -hmm. overall arcing, I guess, broader picture, are there still some pitfalls you still see that maybe with busy coach, you still want to cover in the future? Uh, I think I do need to cover more of um, how to, I mean, still some of the more staff mm -hmm. stuff, I think I need to do more of. Um, I think I need to do more of, um, I don't, I think there is the hustle and grind mentality of the profession. And so I would love to get in earlier with young coaches when they're first starting because i think we all right when you get into the profession we just watch and take on the work ethic 
a lot of times and the actions of what we watch our head coach do, right. you know? And so that is something I think is not right because what do most head coaches do? Right. I mean, it is long hours. I'm going to, you know, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I'm just going to put my head down and I'm going to work. Um, I just think there's smarter ways, smarter ways to go about doing things. So, I mean, I think of anything with busy coach, I need to put myself out there more. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been doing it as a part-time thing while I was coaching for the longest time and I didn't really promote it. But I mean, I think, I think, you know, just because I've been in the profession for so long and because I get to work with, I mean, even today I talked with 15 different coaches on different staffs and even dozens through email. Right. So I get to, I get access to coaches and I get to hear what's working and not working for them. And so if anything, I just need to do a better job. You know, I've, I've got the things in place. I just need to do a better job of getting out in front of more people so I can help more people um, who are stressed and getting a little burned out or maybe feeling like they're working a lot of hours, but not getting, making the impact they want to, they want to make either with their staff. There's a lot of people that just feel like I need to control all of the to do's because they only have young grad assistants. And by the time they finally get into a rhythm of doing the work, they leave and then they got to train somebody else. So it's just, it's just easier for me to do it. Getting out of that mindset, you know, kind of short-term versus long-term short-term is I can just do it. You know, it's faster for me to do it now. It is, but long-term that's time taken away from you maybe spending more time with the the current team and building the culture, going home and resting. So it's just, I don't know. I, I need to put myself out there more, I think is, uh, I think I'm on the right track with, with, the problems that coaches have, it just is, uh, I got to do a better job of putting myself out there to, to be more helpful to coaches that might need and can use the training. No, um, I can definitely relate with some of those topics that you were talking about with areas mm-hmm. coaches still need help because there's just things that, you know, I think every coach has done. Uh, Mandy, we've already kept you past, uh, you know, we said this would be a 30 minute conversation. No, and I've been rambling on, so I apologize. No, no. If I, I could get fired you- up talking about these things. And that's, yeah, no, I'm like sitting here going, this is great because this is just, it's, this is conversation has just been wonderful. If I could ask one more question, you sure. talked about burnout. I think yeah. that's one of the biggest things coaches, um, even CEOs, people in positions deal with because it just, you have staff, you train, like you said, and then the new one comes in. So you got to take training and then yep. vice versa. What is something that if a coach is listening right now um, is, and is maybe experiencing burnout, you would give a bit of advice to? Ooh, um, you know, I actually just wrote, so I put out an article every Sunday and I had after the coaches convention, mm-hmm. somebody texted me saying, aren't you tired? Like, you got to be tired. Like, I've been watching you do mm-hmm. all of this stuff for so long. Like, aren't you tired? Aren't you burnt out? And I'm like, mm, I mean, I certainly, right. I get tired. Um, but I mean, so in this article, I kind of talked about some, I mean, just the habits you have, you know, is, is, and I mean, I, I mean, certainly the habits of resting and recharging your batteries. Um, it was something that I talked about. I mean, I talked about using my planner because so, it keeps me focused on why I am doing what I'm doing. I think people are guilty of looking at their phone more than looking at their goals. And so they get burnt out because they just get, again, get distracted by all the other things, but looking and visualizing and feeling, you know, the end result that might you know, be the thing if you actually accomplish your goal, like, so staying focused on those things, but that's planning. But then the other thing that I mentioned in this article was, um, you got to surround yourself and find the time to be around the people that you love to do the things you love to do. Um, you know, like even, and, and something I I try to do with my planning, like it's amazing, like even journaling, Mm -hmm. like, it took me mm-hmm. forever to kind of get into the habit of it, but like the, like, so even with the planning part of it is at the beginning of the day, it's, I would just journal and had a few little prompts that I was trying to answer, but it got thoughts out of my head. It helped me organize it. It kind of got my energy going in the right direction in the morning. 
But then I also was, um, at the end of the day, scoring my habits and giving myself a little evaluation of how I did. And even then just, you know, the practice of gratitude, it's amazing. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the journaling and the gratitude stuff, it's so simple and it takes me like 10, 15 seconds to do. I mean, the, the gratitude part, but just it focuses me on uh, the impact I can make and what I love about it and why I should appreciate the opportunity mm-hmm. that I have. And it just gets me feeling, feeling the emotions of it. That helps me. It, it's not, again, it's not that I don't get tired. I just have found that this helps me recover faster mm-hmm. and not go down deeper rabbit holes with some of the things, but it's just energy, right? Where do you get your energy from? And a lot of times it's coaches aren't doing enough to bring that energy. And so, so, you know, some of the, the habits and some of the the planning and the gratitude and the journal stuff, and then, to, you know, my family, I wasn't, I did not do a great job of, for the longest time of doing things for me, but doing things for my family. And I think it's, I mean, it's a lot, I mean, I think it's a very individual thing, but what is, what do you love and what gives you energy? And even it's having the courage to ask what is causing you, you know, to, what do you not like? What is, who, who, who is the person that's causing your energy to be negative or drain you? You know, it's just having the courage to ask that, but also being intentional about doing more things that bring you mental, physical energy and, you know, rejuvenation, I think. Again, that's a really long answer to your short question, but it's, um, it's, there's a lot of things I think that are so involved with that, but it's just recognizing, am I in a place where I'm, I'm not, you know, not as motivated as I need to be. As soon as that is the case, go get help. You know, somebody, there's somebody out there. And if you want to come to me, right, I'd love, you know, however I can help, but it's uh, recognizing when that is the thing. And before you get too deep and can't get yourself out of it, that's where I would, uh, cause I didn't, I didn't ask for help. I didn't. And I got to the point where coaching wasn't fun for me anymore. And it wasn't, I probably, and I know I wasn't a very pleasant person to be around because I didn't do enough of those types of things, but my schedule's three times as busy as it ever was when I was a coach now. But those are some practices that I've put in to play. And yes, I still get tired, but I am, I am recovering a lot faster and sustaining, you know, and, and optimizing instead of going, going deep, going deep in the holes every now and then, right. You get stressed. Oh yeah. I'm I'm a girl, right. I get stressed. I get overwhelmed and it's, uh, but still it's, uh, you know, practices in place. It didn't happen overnight. Right. It, uh, it's, it, it took a little bit to do and it took coaching to, to get there, but you know, a lot of little things all added up. Yeah. That's, that's really, really great advice. Um, and thank you so much for that. Cause I had the whole time sitting there, I'm listening, like I, I gotta ask about burnout because that's yeah. it's one of the biggest things when I talk to coaches. So yeah, but we can certainly relate, you know, going through that and, you know, our schedules get hectic and, you know, but that's really good advice. And this has been fantastic. So, no, thanks. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. So Mandy, where can people find you? Yeah. You know what? My website is currently under construction. It is being uh, switched over to, but, but still busy.coach is my website or on Twitter. I think my Twitter is a uh, at Mandy green CPS. My company used to be called coaching productivity strategies. So CPS, um, but Mandy at busy.coach are, you know, so my website, Twitter, I, I'm on, on Instagram, it's confusing to me for some reason. I don't, I don't vibe with, with Instagram very well, but Twitter, Twitter, my website, or just email me bandy at busy.coach. All right. And all right. And, um, we can be found on Twitter at TOTWAG and on Instagram and Facebook at the one team we agree on and on YouTube at the one team we agree on, as well as all major podcasting platforms. Um, Mandy, thank you so much for coming on. This was fantastic. Yes, for sure. And uh, also thank you to Todd uh, for helping us with this episode. Really appreciate it. And, um, and this is all for this episode of the One Team We Agree On. 
Yep. Make sure to follow and um, like and subscribe. And we'll be back soon for uh, more episodes. And um, thanks for listening. Yeah. And until next time. I'm Jillian. And I'm Kyle. We'll see you soon at the games. Yes, we will.